A very warm welcome to you. My name's Renee. If you don't know me, I um, help oversee the discipleship groups here at City Light. Um, you might have met my husband, Sam. He preached a couple of weeks back on the topic of peace. Um, and did an extremely good job. I also thought I'd give a bit of a shout out to Jackie Bromo, who is my mother-in-law this morning. Um, you throw incredibly good pups and I am very thankful to be benefiting from your amazing mothering of my husband, so thank you for that. Um, I've been doing a women's Bible study this year looking at the book of 1 Peter, um, which we're going to be going through a section of today. And I'm just feeling very privileged to speak on Mother's Day, um, as I've been reflecting on just how significant um, many women from within City Light have been uh, for me in my own spiritual walk, um, and have very much just been like spiritual mothers to me, and um, their insights actually, as we've been going through 1 Peter, have really helped shape my sermon today. Um, So yeah, I'd love to just give a shout out to them too. Um, So if you haven't been following along with us so far, we've been working through Nijay Gupta's 15 New Testament Words of Life, and we've been looking at the original background and theological importance of these really um, theologically weighty words, such as peace and love um, and grace and hope, Um, and we're looking at them as they appear in the biblical texts. And we've been doing this in an attempt to understand these words in their original context. So we don't want to read into the text, um, meaning that was never intended um, by importing our modern day understandings onto these words, but we actually want to read what the biblical authors have to say and really just attempt to hear what God has to say about these words um, and in doing so attempt to apply them more rightly to our lives. So this week we are looking at the word holiness which is a very big topic. Um, Gupta actually begins his chapter on holiness by stating it's hard to define, but I'll know it when I see it. So it was very difficult actually, um, yeah, figuring out how to really express this um, succinctly. So I actually asked Chat GTP to define holiness for me. Are there any people in the congregation today that are a fan of Chat GTP? No? Okay, well, I can assure you that I didn't write my sermon using artificial intelligence apart from this, Um, but I actually think it did a really good job of um, summarising what holiness means. So it said, Holiness refers to the state or quality of being morally and spiritually pure, consecrated, and set apart for a sacred or divine purpose. It is often associated with righteousness, godliness, and devotion to God. Holiness entails a hatred of sin, evil, and impurity, and a dedication to living a life that is aligned with godly principles and values. It involves a pursuit of moral excellence and a desire to reflect the character and nature of God in one's thoughts, attitudes, actions, and relationships. So I thought that was pretty good from chat, G2P. They did, they did well there. Um, But to sort of break it down even further, it's really helpful for us to look at the word holy in both the Hebrew word and the Greek word, which I'm probably going to do a terrible job of attempting to um, pronounce these, but I'll give it a go. So the Hebrew word kwadosh and the Greek word hagios, both of which mean set apart or sacred. Um, So the word holiness is rarely used in modern day language. Um, In informal language, you might have heard people say holy cow or holy smokes or holy moly as a way to express surprise, astonishment or amazement. Or you might have heard it used in a pejorative sense. So the expression holier than thou is used to denote someone who has this attitude of moral superiority or an inflated sense of their own righteousness. And so holiness in our modern day context is extremely difficult to define because we just don't use it very much. But the first thing we notice about holiness in the Old Testament is that it intrinsically belongs to God. The angelic beings in Revelation 4, 8, day and night, they sing without ceasing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And R.C. Sproul notes that no other attribute of God is used three times in succession to describe him. 
Nowhere in scripture does it say that God is love, 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 or that he is mercy, 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 but it does say that he is holy, 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 and so it makes sense for us to pay, to pay careful attention to what holiness means. The holiness of God is completely otherly. It is unattainable, incomprehensible, and our human minds cannot seem to fully fathom it. 1 Samuel 2, 2 says, There is no one holy like the Lord, and there is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Apart from hearing the prophets speak about the holiness of God, there are also holiness texts that show us instances in which people uh, come into God's presence and are just overwhelmed by his moral purity and excellence. So we have um, the instance of Moses on the burning bush, where God appears to Moses in a burning bush, and the bush doesn't burn up. And what is significant about this story is that the divine voice warns him, remove the sandals from your feet, for you are standing on holy ground. God transforms common unholy things into holy things just because of his proximity. His presence is purifying. And we see this again as God reveals himself to the people of God at the foot of Mount Sinai. God has just redeemed the people of God out of slavery in Egypt and he brings the Israelites to camp at the base of Mount Sinai for the better part of the year. And there is this stormy pyrotechnic display of the Holy One of Israel. There is thunder and lightning and a voice that booms from the mountain. And the peak of the mountain that God inhabits echoes the holiness of God. The mountain is so affected by the presence of Yahweh that similar to the event at the burning bush, the ground is declared as holy and God instructs Moses to create a boundary so that the people do not touch the mountain lest they be put to death. See, the thing about the holiness of God is that because he is so morally perfect, if you are impure, his presence is actually dangerous to you. And it's not because he is bad. The Bible Project notes it's because he is so good. Um, and the Bible Project uses this analogy of a burning sun and um, the epicenter of the burning sun being a representing God. And the closer you get to uh, the object of purity, the more dangerous it actually becomes to you. And that is why God establishes such strict orders for obtaining moral and ritual purity among the people of God in the Old Testament. Because for God's presence to be able to dwell in, with the people in the tabernacle, they needed to make themselves clean. They needed to consecrate themselves. They needed an animal without spot or blemish die in their place to atone for their sin, to cover over their uncleanliness and impurity. But even though God alone is holy, uh, he can share this attribute with, and status with other things and beings as they become closely identified with him. So Israel is God's holy nation because of their relationship to the holy God. And that is why we are God's holy people or why we would refer to God's holy angels. So how is holiness used in the New Testament? Well, we actually see the New Testament writers um, referring to it in three different tenses. That we are holy, that we are becoming holy, and that we will one day be perfectly holy. So we are holy. The writers of the New Testament epistles identify those who have been brought into the new covenant as holy, just like the Israelites were set apart as God's holy people. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Hebrew 10.10 10 tells us we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It is past tense. And A.W. Tozer speaks about this in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He says, God is holy with an absolute holiness that knows no degrees, and this he cannot impart to his creatures. But there is a relative and contingent holiness which he shares with angels and seraphim in heaven and with redeemed men on earth as their preparation for holiness. The holiness God can and does impart to his children. He shares it with them by imputation, 
which is to apply to one's account on the basis of Christ, and impartation through the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification. And because he has made it available to them, he requires it of them. To Israel first and later to his church, God spoke saying, be ye holy for I am holy. See, Tozer is saying that God has applied to our account on the basis of Christ's atoning work, atoning work, positional holiness with God. When God looks at us, he actually sees the righteousness of Christ. We are holy and blameless and pure in his sight. But he also calls us to practical holiness. And Tozer explains the means for pursuing practical holiness is through the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification in our lives. We are called to dependency in this area, but it is not a passive dependency. We have been called to pursue a holy life for our joy and for his glory. Which brings us to our next point. We are being made holy. So what have we been set apart for? We've been set apart for holiness. We have not just been saved unto God for our salvation. We have been saved for holiness. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The text we're looking at today in 1 Peter, uh, we see holiness language littered all over its pages. Peter is actually writing this epistle to God's chosen people and he refers to them as exiles. Not because they are literal exiles, but because they are spiritual exiles. And it's believed that this letter was written during a time when Emperor Nero was in power in Rome and a great persecution was taking place. And the people that Paul, Peter sorry, is writing this letter to are experiencing rejection and persecution. And Peter is keen to remind them that, of who they are and what they have been saved for. And we can see that Peter is actually calling us to three types of holiness in this passage. Holiness in what we think, holiness in what we feel, and holiness in how we act. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to read it together. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much that you have made us holy and that you have called us to holiness too, Lord. Uh, we thank you that by your Spirit's work we can be changed um, more into the likeness of your Son um, and that we can... Um, become more like you, Lord. Um, reflect to a watching world the image of our Creator. And we just pray as we open this 1 Peter text today that you would help us to understand it, to, um, to just let it change us as well, Father, that we would not go away from it with this sermon with more knowledge, Lord, but that um, our hearts would be uh, ready to change in the ways that you are calling us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're reading 1 Peter 1, 13 to 23, so you can open it up with me. I'm reading from the NIV version. It says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. But now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. So the word therefore um, at the beginning of this passage uh, connects it with the previous passage. In the first 12 verses, Peter has actually been talking about what God has accomplished through Christ. He tells us that we have been born again to a living hope. 
that we have an inheritance that is kept in heaven for us, that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading. And he also speaks about trials and suffering that the people of God may encounter. And this theme is fleshed out in later chapters in greater detail, but for here and now, he encourages them that they are not purposeless, that the testing of their faith will also purify their faith and result in glory and honour when Christ returns. And finally, he speaks about salvation, reminding us that the Old Testament prophets carefully inquired about the coming Messiah that was promised, and that even angels longed to look into the wonder and beauty of the gospel message. And so in light of all these wonderful and excellent truths, Peter actually uses this this phrase that appears in the King James Version. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. So this is a phrase that might be pretty unfamiliar to us, but to the original recipients of Peter's letter, they would have understood its meaning quite quickly. It refers to someone pulling up the long flowing garments that they were wearing which could hinder their movements and tying them around their waist so that they could move freely. And metaphorically, it would have translated to this idea of getting ready for action or making sure that you are prepared. And Peter says, with minds that are ready for action and self-controlled or sober-minded, we are to set our hope fully, not partially, not in varying degrees, but fully on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. More than ever before in human history, our minds are preoccupied, distracted, persistently entertained, and grossly overinformed. If Peter is actually calling us to be ready for action, to be alert, the antonym of which is to be inattentive, then it makes sense to consider the ways in which our minds are being distracted. I'm currently reading a book called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari. And he seeks to understand why as we as a generation are increasingly unable to pay attention. Though a secular writer, Joe Han writes about our diminishing ability to focus on what really matters. He suggests that our connections and relationships are taking a hit. Things like our ability to maintain concentration when we're in conversation with someone or being present in the physical world, experiencing with awe and wonder the beauty that is all around us. But I would actually add that our ability to focus on what really matters also includes the things of God. Our ability to sit down and read the scriptures and take them in has been greatly diminished. Our ability to sit down with the creator of the universe in sustained prayer is being impacted by our inability to maintain our attention and focus. Never has there been a greater war for our minds, for our attention. And one of the scientists Johan interviews in this book, he says this, we told ourselves that we could have a massive expansion in the amount of information that we are exposed to and the speed in which it hits us with no cost. This is a delusion. More importantly, what we are sacrificing is depth in all its dimensions. Depth takes time and depth takes reflection. It takes energy, it takes long time spans and it takes commitment. It takes attention, right? And Peter in this passage is actually all about our attention. He wants us to consider where we are placing it. And there is a correlation between where our minds focus and what happens as a result of that focus. And Peter is saying, don't be inattentive. Don't play the, downplay the significance of where you concentrate your attention because it will greatly impact how you live out your time on this earth it will greatly impact your ability to be ready for action when it comes to kingdom business. And where does he want us to look? At the grace that will be revealed to us when Jesus Christ returns. He says, cultivate that hope by considering it with your mind. The 19th century poet William Blake rightly penned that we become what we behold because what we behold affects the way we think the way we feel, and in turn, the way we act. If we want our minds to be ready for action, we must set our minds on eternal things. If we want to pursue holiness in our minds, we must consider what we are concentrating our attention on. And Peter then calls us to holiness in what we feel. He calls us to renounce the evil desires we have when we lived in ignorance 
and live out our time on this earth with reverent fear. Verse 14 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. And Peter expands on this thought in 1 Peter 4, 3, by listing some of the things he is calling the people of God to renounce. He says, Immorality and lust, drunkenness, wild parties, and the worshipping of idols. You were ignorant then, but now you have been enlightened. So seek to live out your days in light of the truth that has been revealed to you. Going back to our definition of holiness to be set apart for sacred use, uh, there should be something tangibly different about the people of God. Peter then references Leviticus 11.44 Verse 15 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Tosa says about this Levitical command that God is not saying, Be ye holy as I am holy. He says, Be ye holy for I am holy. We cannot achieve perfect purity of character in this life, for that only belongs to God. He is not saying, Be just as I am. He is saying, image after me so that you can show to a watching world that you are mine. And notice that the very impetus for holiness is rooted in the truth that God is actually holy. Our motivation for pursuing holiness should be that God is holy, that we want to image after our creator. There are actually many reasons for pursuing holiness. The Pharisees were very keen to show that they were set apart for sacred use. Actually, the pejorative term holier than thou would be a very fitting <laughs> phrase for the Pharisees. Luke 20, 46 to 47 says, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honour at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. While it is not wrong for us to desire that others would regard our character well, we are cautioned to not engage in public displays of holiness for personal recognition and applause. He says, instead of conforming to your evil desires, live in reverent fear. Verse 17 says, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. The fear of the Lord is a term that is sometimes difficult to define and scholars debate about its meaning. But in this passage, living with reverent fear is connected with the presupposition that we will call on God for help, not just as a father, but also as a judge. And Peter actually wants us to hold in our mind the truth that God is both father and judge, loving and just. And this reverent fear will be cultivated from rightly thinking about the way that God will judge. He tells us God will judge us impartially, that he won't be biased. Any vision of God without acknowledgement of these two qualities in equal degree will not produce in us the sort of reverent fear we are being called to possess. And God's people do not fear punishment, for Christ has taken that upon himself once and for all. But we do rightly consider that one day we will give an account for everything that we have done. And if we look to scripture, we see that the fear of the Lord actually lies at the very heart of successful living. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 19.23 says, Fear of the Lord leads to life, bringing security and protection from harm. We should fear the Lord because he is both our father and impartial judge, but also because in fearing God and living in obedience to him, we find protection and we find true happiness. Charles Spurgeon says, I would sooner be holy than happy if the two things could be divorced. Were it possible for a man always to sorrow and yet to be pure, I would choose the sorrow if I might win the purity, for to be free from the power of sin, to be made to love holiness, is true happiness. Charles is saying that holiness and happiness cannot be divorced. They are intertwined so intrinsically in the life of a believer that any other pursuit will leave us wanting. True happiness and joy can only be found in living a life of obedience. 
Which brings us to our final call to holiness, holiness in action. And there is one thing Peter calls us to refrain from and one thing he encourages us to do. He encourages us to refrain in that we don't continue to sin in the futile ways you inherited from your forefathers. And the holy action Peter encourages us to engage in is sincere brotherly love. Verse 22 says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. See, sometimes we think of holiness as a purely individual pursuit. We see it as personal piety. But holiness is actually entirely social. It is not just a moral standard, it is a relational one. And Gupta says about this verse, we have been purified by the truth to display the character of, the go of God and this is especially evident in mutual love. And that is why the Pharisees' pursuit of holiness was completely in vain because they didn't recognise that a life of holiness was not about rule keeping, it was about love. Love for God and love for neighbour. I thought in keeping with Mother's Day that it would be good to have some examples of women that evidenced exceptional holiness following from a heart of exceptional love. Um, and so Mother, and Therese, Mother Teresa and Corrie Ten Boone came to mind. Mother Teresa was a Catholic nun who dedicated her life to serving the poor and sick in Calcutta, India. And Mother Teresa is remembered for her compassion, love and selflessness. But she's considered a model of holiness for her willingness to serve others and for her deep trust in God's providence. And Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch Christian who helped to hide Jews from the Nazis during World War II. Ten Boom is remembered for her courage, faith and forgiveness. And she is considered a model of holiness for her commitment to loving her enemies and her trust in God's sovereignty even in the midst of suffering. See, reflecting back on Gupta's initial statement about holiness, that it's hard to define, but we'll know it when we see it. When we look to the lives of these women, we see it. We see lives that were all about reflecting their creator, being set apart. To the world, their love, courage, forgiveness, and faith looked like madness. But to God, their lives were set apart for holy use to image to a watching world the very nature of a holy and loving God. If there is an area of your life that you are struggling to lay down, I'd invite you to be encouraged in handing over these areas of struggle to your discipleship groups this week and bearing these things together in community. Um, for getting things out like the discipleship pathway and actually committing to growing in overcoming sin and um, your personal relationship with God. And the last um, point, which is we will be holy. The New Testament writers reveal to us that one day we will not just be positionally holy, but we will be holy in every way. 1 John 3, 2 says, We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. See, one of the significant things that happens to us when we grow in holiness is that we realise the depths of our own unholiness and become increasingly grieved by the state of our own sinful hearts. And I am convinced that any pursuit of holiness that doesn't look back to the cross and full forward to our future glorification will leave us wanting. And so with the knowledge that we have been made holy by the blood of Christ and that we will one day be perfectly holy, completely sinless like he is, let us consider how to encourage one another to pursue a holy life, to be set apart for sacred use, to image to a watching world the holiness of our God. And so we're going to have a time of communion now. Um, I think one of the most remarkable things that happens on account of Jesus' death is actually that we can behold the Holy One of Israel, that we can come close to a holy God, that we no longer have to make sacrifice, that he has actually made the sacrifice for us once and for all. And so if you're in Christ today, I encourage you to come and to take communion and to um, consider what these elements mean, that actually 
As we take the bread, we remember that his body was broken for us. And as we take the juice, we actually remember that his blood was poured out for us, that he actually enables us to be in relationship with the Holy God. But if you are here and you have heard about this Holy God, but you do not yet know him, I just want to encourage you to to really just take this time to remain in your seat and consider um, what it means to be in relationship with him. That actually holiness and happiness, those things, two things cannot be divorced. That um, perhaps your attempts to try to live a holy life or a good or moral life um, have left you really deflated. That um, I would encourage you just to receive Jesus, to receive him today. Receive the third person of the Trinity who, whose actual primary task is to grow you in holiness.